everyone, this is Andrew from Operant Animal Training, and in this video, I want to give you the science behind modern behavior modification. What it is, where it comes from, and why you should be using it. I'm going to try and make it as clear, concise, and fun as possible, just like I hope you are doing in your training sessions. In the early 20th century, some key scientists were attempting to understand behavior from a more scientific perspective. Ivan Pavlov and his famous study of salivating dogs, i.e. the learned association between two events, gave us classical conditioning, which is when an unconscious, involuntary, automatic response is paired with a stimulus. For example, our clickers are classically conditioned. They have no real meaning at first, but the sound takes on new meaning when it is quickly and predictably followed by some food, a primary reinforcer. It's a learned association. The bell or clicker is a secondary reinforcer and also a bridge. While our goal is to teach our animals to respond consciously to our interactions with them, it's important to understand how classical conditioning works and how it differs from operant conditioning. So I decided to employ operant conditioning techniques, building on the works of Thorndike and B.F. Skinner. Yet by this time next week, I believe I can have her jumping out of a pool, balancing a beach ball on her nose. <laughs> Classical conditioning forms an association between two stimuli. Operant conditioning forms an association between a behavior and a consequence. In 1905, Edward Thorndike published The Law of Effect, which states, Responses that produce a satisfying effect in a particular situation become more likely to occur again in that situation, and responses that produce a discomforting effect become less likely to occur again in that situation. His experiments also demonstrated that punishment did not necessarily weaken the bond between a stimulus and a response, and that reinforcement was far more effective at shaping behavior. It wasn't until 1938 that B.F. Skinner, the influential Harvard psychology professor, brought everything together under one roof with the publication of his first book, Behavior of Organisms. What is operant conditioning? Now, rewards and punishments are what the layman thinks of. Well, they're special cases, but they're not general enough to, uh, to, to cover the thing. You get an organism doing something, and if you then make a reinforcer contingent upon what he's doing, he'll tend to do it again. And the reinforcers you use in the laboratory are the simple ones, like food for a hungry organism or water for a thirsty one. But in daily life, all kinds of things are, are reinforcing. I, I, I gave a lecture at the Guggenheim some time ago in which I claimed that the word beautiful simply means reinforcing. Skinner would go on to pioneer applied behavior analysis, which today is used heavily in things like brain rehabilitation, psychotherapy, parenting, health and exercise, education, sports, substance abuse, and the list goes on. Skinner popularized four quadrants of learning which together are called operant conditioning. Positive reinforcement is adding something to the animal's environment, increasing the behavior it follows. For example, giving a tasty treat to a dog as a reward for a correct behavior. Negative reinforcement is removing something from the animal's environment, increasing the behavior it follows. For example, you put on your seatbelt to stop that horrible beeping sound. Negative reinforcement is not punishment. Punishment comes after a behavior. You can't avoid it by changing your actions. Think negative like math, subtracting something from the scenario. Unfortunately, a lot of traditional animal and human training is done entirely by negative reinforcement. It is essentially working to avoid or to make something unpleasant stop. Negative punishment is removing something from the animal's environment, decreasing the behavior it follows. For example, you end the training session, removing the opportunity for reinforcement, following an incorrect behavior. Positive punishment is adding something to the animal's environment, decreasing the behavior it follows. For example, someone or something does something you don't like, so you strike them. Skinner attacked the problem of reinforcement versus punishment in depth, and concluded that while punishment will fix a temporary problem, it tends to be the wrong way to go about doing things. When you introduce something aversive as a consequence of behavior, you are telling the animal what they did wrong instead of what to do and then hoping that they will generalize the punishment. Two graduate students of Skinner, Marianne Breland Bailey and Keller Breland, recognized the commercial applications of operant conditioning and founded Animal Behavior Enterprises in 1943. 
Together, they established the field of applied animal psychology, and most modern animal training programs can trace their origins to them. After Keller died in 1965, Marianne married Bob Bailey, who had been the general manager for ABE since the early 60s, when they were training dolphins for the U.S. Navy. The pair said, at the beginning of this century, in slightly over 100 years of combined training experience with over 10,000 animals from over 145 species, we have used punishment about 12 times. Reward the good behavior. This brings us to the present day and important industry leaders like Ken Ramirez, Karen Pryor, and Terry Ryan are continuing to inspire the next generation of animal trainers like myself to keep advancing positive reinforcement-based training and programs around the world. Great training is an essential component of any animal training program. It is a, one of the best tools you can use to help secure them and control their environment. A good deal of training time and energy should be devoted to making sure your animal loves being in their crate. Whatever you do, do not just lock them in there and leave them alone. They should in be introduced slowly in a, and in a fun way. They should be durable, easy to clean, large enough that your animal can turn around comfortably inside them, and always introduced in a fun way, which is what we're going to show you now. This one is actually the old model for our girl Reese, but this is just so you guys can see how to start it off. Begin by just throwing some food inside the crate and bridging appropriately. That's it. Next, ask the animal inside the crate, keep the door open, then ask them to lie down and keep feeding them for maintaining their level of calm and comfort inside the crate with the door open. Once you see they're nice and relaxed, then you can ask them back out. Next, ask them to go inside the crate, close the door, make sure they're lying down, getting comfortable and fed for being relaxed and start to remove yourself from the equation. Back up slowly and if they maintain their calm, come back and reinforce them for it. You'll know you're well on your way to having this behavior complete when the animal will go voluntarily inside the crate, allow you to close the door, lie down comfortably, take a small amount of reinforcement and allow you to walk away and come back at your discretion without making any sort of complaint. Continue to work on this until you've built up long durations of up to four hours at a time by the time they are around four months old is when you, they can start to be left alone for that long. Thanks for watching. We hope you enjoyed it. Don't forget to like and subscribe for more great content. Got a question?